Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, we have a returning guest, Dwayne Roussel. Uh, I believe most of you should already be familiar with him. I had a really good response to the last time Dwayne was on. So that's not why I brought him back, but he's back. And uh, I'm not going to do the long introduction again. We're going to get right into it. Today, we're talking about uh, Zizek, who... Uh, is someone Dwayne has had an ongoing correspondence with. I don't know how direct, but we'll talk about that. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna jump right in. So, uh, Dwayne, how are you? What are you? What's going on with you uh, lately? Uh, I know you got uh, a couple new books out, right? Yes, yes. There's a few more books out. Um, what are they? Uh, the, the first one, I think, is, was that recent? It was Post-Anarchism and Psychoanalysis, which is, um, I think, a transcript of a series of talks. So yeah. it's, a, it's a book that was spoken, not written. Uh, and that changes things considerably, as you can tell from those of you who are reading it. It makes it easier to read. You can read very quickly, but also a bit of a labyrinth and so on. Um, and, uh, and then there was an edited volume with uh, Mark Gerard Murphy, uh, titled Negativity and Psychoanalysis, Theory and Clinic. I think that's the subtitle, <laughs> slipping my mind now, um, which uh, is a book that we edited, but it has a number of um, chapters from people we thought were quite interesting and people that are having debates and, and working this question of negativity in the clinic. Um, and, and it was also my latent way of responding to uh, the Slovenian school, Zizek, Alenka, Suponsik, Moladen, Dolaire, and so on. Um, a, a way of formulating something of an answer that wasn't exactly an answer. And um, and a new book coming out, I think, in a month with Bloomsbury titled uh, Psychoanalytic Sociology, uh, A New Theory of the Social Bond, which is um, a book that's actually written, but it's also a, a little bit of a weird book because it's got kind of three different ways you can read it. I'll just leave that out there for you to figure out what I mean by that. All right. Well, I'm, I, I'm the sociology one. I'm pretty, I'm really looking forward to reading that one when it comes out. That's gonna, you know, it's right up my alley. So, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. So on that topic, right. Um, I guess on the, on the last couple of things you said about the negativity book and this one, you do have some kind of correspondence and even uh, in your orientation with what you write about with Slavoj Žižek, but I'm not really clear on what the, uh, what that, the shape of that relationship is. If it's, you know, I know you spent a long time studying uh, his work and yada, 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 but yeah, uh, so I think I, I, well, I first encountered Zizek's work um, as an undergraduate student. Uh, I wouldn't say his work was entirely the gateway to Lacanian psychoanalysis for me, but it was one of the pathways, among others. And something appealed to me in his thinking, in his um, ideas, and in his uh his way of holding himself that uh, drew me to it. And I remember very clearly when I was doing my first PhD in Toronto, we were reading Zizek. And we were also, we were reading Nietzsche, we were reading, you know, all of these thinkers. But I remember thinking something very clearly. If I took the risk of being bold like this, both in my style and style is a very important word in psychoanalysis, particularly for Lacan. Uh, Lacan opened his écrit with a quotation, style is the man himself. Uh, so it was obviously style was a very important concept or um, word or signifier for Lacan. And Zizek certainly had his style. And I, I remember thinking if I replicated this style or if I had a style like this, or a style at all that was bold and idiosyncratic, I wouldn't be, I, I probably wouldn't make it through 
this PhD, they would fail. Like if I wrote like Franz Fanon with ellipses and stutters and stammers, I, 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 that would get a fail. And yet we're reading this book and we're reporting upon it. And that, that seemed weird to me. So I thought, I'm going to go study with the people that I'm reading. I couldn't study with Nietzsche, but I studied in the mountains where Nietzsche studied in Switzerland. Oh, um, nice. I guess he, he was in the cabins and he was, I, I don't know the story, something about describing the air there in one of his letters. Uh, so I went to study with, with Zizek and I was his teaching assistant. He called me his slave. Uh, <laughs> And and I, I was an assistant for Alain Badu as well. And so I studied with these people, Giorgio Agamben, and Judith Butler, and, and so on. They were all teaching at this university. Uh, and that's where I really forcefully encountered Zizek's work, but also Badu's work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that was at ECS, right? Yes, the European Graduate School. Or EGS. Um, what? How yeah. many people? How many students do they usually have? It seems like such a prestigious, or like at least uh, a people by a lot of prestigious uh, left thinkers that you would think everyone wants to go there. Uh, not exactly. When I signed up, I had to write a letter, and I wrote something because I could tell by the application that they they wanted us to prove that we had style. Uh, it, I remember distinctively it said in the application that we uh, are looking for scholars that are ferociously independent. Um, I remember that phrase, and I think that phrase was put in there by a wonderful scholar who was director at the time named Wolfgang Schirmacher, who I'm still friends with. He's a great uh, person. And uh, so I wrote some poetic bullshit. Uh, and I, I, I somehow raised up a bunch of money and I flew there not knowing if this place was a fraud because some people were saying this is not a real university. We don't even know if it exists and all these other things. So I'm flying out. And even when I landed, I remember walking into Sass Face, uh, thinking Sass Face, the city, thinking now I'm going to find out if this university is really here. <laughs> and oh, my God. I, I step up to the Hotel Alalan, which was the, the place where you register for the class. And uh, I see standing there, Gail Garcia Barnell, who is a fairly well-known uh, actor uh, and producer who played Che Guevara in the Motorcycle Diaries, among other wonderful okay. roles. And I said, huh. And I learned he was in my class. I, I sat beside him. We talked. He was an interesting person. Uh, and then I would say the classroom was full of weird people like me, but each in their own way. You had artists. You had painters. You had actors. You had people from all over the world who took a gamble and showed up there. And, um, and it was one of the singular transformative experiences of my life. Um, I felt a part of uh, a spirit of daring thought. Um, the Lacanians were there in their cartels, risking interesting ideas. I met Daniel Tut there. I met G uh, Gabriel uh, uh, Tupanamba there. I met uh, so many Lacanians that are now uh, um, publishing books and somewhat but known on, on the internet and so on. We were there together that year, 2011, I think the summer of 2011. And I would say there's one classroom, maybe two, and you have to climb the Swiss Alps to get up there. Not all the way up, but you do climb the Alps to get to this interesting um, building with a giant gong in the classroom. And you feel like you're a part of something special. There's rumors that Adorno took a heart attack there and, and, and these sorts of things, you know? So you feel like you're a part. I'm not saying any of this is true. I'm just saying this is what it felt like. And I, I would say there was about 50 students in the room. Um, and we witnessed um, thinking without boundaries. Zizek showed porn. And he was pointing at the porn on the screen. <laughs> You can't do this in other 
places, you know? He wasn't doing it to provoke us. He was trying to show us a very interesting idea that was interesting and important re regarding the big other and how the camera is used in pornography. Um, are you familiar with Esalon, which was like, you know, Fritz Perls and a lot of the psychoanalysts? I think it was, it's in America. It was like a, I don't think it was a graduate school. It was some kind of research facility, but had it's uh, described in a very similar way. Uh, not no? familiar. Not, not ah, familiar. Okay. With, but, but, you know, what, what's, what's fascinating is that it's not exactly a fraternity, but, you, you know, when you leave this place, you realize that these people that you met, they're distributed all around the world. And it's kind oh, of yeah. fascinating. Um, it's, um, yeah, we called it the Magic Mountain, and I admit I'm a little nostalgic for it. Yeah, I would have called it the Holy Mountain. <laughs> Feels bad, way. Um, so, all right, anyway, Zizek, right. So you did actually, uh, you were a research assistant for him. So you have that in-person background together. Um, as far as your work goes, especially recently, what do you, what would you say are some of like the, the central differences or, or things that you're having a conversation with him about? Um, cause for someone who's not, you know, in, uh, initiated into the post-Lacanian discourse. It's a little hard to tell from outside. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's really kind of complicated. And one of the ways that our debates have, have gone over the years is they tend to be framed around topical issues. So um, when the war happened between Russia and Ukraine, when it first started, uh, we entered into something of a debate concerning how to think about that. It was really a debate about the, uh, theory. It was a theoretical debate. It wasn't a debate about the war. It was a, it was a debate about really um, the early to middle period of Lacanian psychoanalysis versus the later period is really what it was about. It's really about Lacanian psychoanalysis and its relationship to philosophy uh, and to theory as such. It's really about um, the way in which one particular, let's say, disciple of Lacan, Jacques-Alain Miller, uh, had oriented um, Lacan's later teachings into a formation that Lacan called the school, the psychoanalytic school. Uh, it's about these sorts of very technical things. It's about um, the, the question of the place of foreclosure, which is a key concept it appears to be a concept although it's not clear that it has conceptual value for Lacan um, and the expansiveness of this concept can we generalize it um, is can we generalize a notion of madness I, I believe Lacan generalized madness he didn't think only some people are mad he said everyone is mad tout le monde all the world is mad um, and so uh, it, it was about that but it's also about Many other things like new gadgets. We had a little bit of a debate over the emergence of a new uh, phone that came out about seven years ago called the light phone. We had a debate over Donald Rumsfeld's understanding of knowledge um, okay. and his justification for going to war in Iraq. And so our debate is threaded through all of these various topical, but it's really fundamentally a debate about psychoanalysis. And on this point, I hold firm. <laughs> and I mean, I was described recently by some uh, folks in Pakistan as having a zeal, almost a religious attitude towards psychoanalysis. I guess I'm guilty as charged. Um, I hold firm on psychoanalysis and, and uh, the Lacanian uh, orientation. And um, I think uh, this is something we used to hear from Zizek. You can find this on YouTube. Go find it on YouTube if you're watching this now. Try and find the place where Zizek says he's accused. I think he's in New York. And some New York person, quite appropriately, accuses him of being dogmatically Lacanian. And his response is, you're knocking on the open door. I am dogmatically Lacanian. What's funny is <laughs> that I'm not sure he'll ever say that today. 
I'm not sure he would ever say that today. In fact, uh, he seems to be quite Hegelian, quite Marxist in a way, and these sorts of things. And he still has his Lacanian uh, uh, stuff, but um, but um, something's something's uh, changed there. Uh, I think I, I would say I am do dogmatically uh, Lacanian on this point. Uh, I had a, a my cat is uh, very interested in the conversation as well. If you were wondering what the <laughs> tail was flying between the camera and me, um, but uh, yeah, okay, I followed most of that. A little distracted. I did want to ask, you know, the other big thing that uh, Zizek gets attention for is, is Marxism or Stalinism, some might say. I don't even know where that uh, that title is at in his mind these days, but it doesn't it doesn't seem like that's a big part of what you're looking at when you're uh, writing about these topics. What well, what would you say about it? Well, I wonder the utility of uh, Zizek's Marxism on the one hand, but Marxism as it's typically presented, particularly within the university and particularly within the social movements that tend to be inspired by um, Marxian pedagogy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a critic necessarily of Marxism, but and, and I, I'm more in favor of Zizek's Marxism, to be honest. But I think I start uh, from a different point of departure. On this point, I think if I had to choose, to put it simply, between Marshall McLuhan as a thinker of our contemporary era or Marx, I think I would choose McLuhan. Uh, and the reason for that is because I think that Marxism has a tendency to presume that we live in a world, a world being a concept that I use to describe um, uh, something like what Lacan called the big other, in the unconscious. These are all synonyms in some way. Uh, and if we live in a world, if we're beings in a world, uh, then part of the Marxist project is what Zizek has called for a very long time, ideology critique. So what is ideology critique? It, I think for Zizek, it consists of multiple things, but one of which is to expose a domain of unknown knowledge, tacit knowledge, which is the definition of the Freudian unconscious. And on the right. other hand, it's, um, it's to expose the totality of relationships among, let's say, laborers or something like this. I'm putting it very simply for the, for, for the sake of keeping the conversation going because I don't want to get hung yeah, up sure. too much in the details. But this concept of totality is something that Zizek defends admirably. I, 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 I admire this concept. Uh, I think there's something to it. But I, I, I counterpose the concept of totality, which is latent in a world and perhaps revealed through, I don't know, discussions of commodity fetishism and... Uh, alienation and all this sort of stuff, and, and particularly in Marx 1844 and before. Um, I counterpose all that to singularity. On the one hand, there's a theory of totality which exists in a world. Zizek's work is in a world. He imagines mm. he's in a world. He imagines there is a world. He believes in the world. Um, on the other hand, singularity is without a world. It's asocial. There's no world there. It's on the it's 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 without world. And so when you're in an era of singularity, it's a question of how to build a world. So I have a fundamentally different point of departure. If I may, I'd like to develop it just a little bit more. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so I think the environment today is not one of world in this traditional sense where you can reveal a domain of unknown knowns. There's some sort of totality that needs to be revealed in this sort of stuff. I think our world is one of excess. It's a limitless world, if there's world at all, which makes it not a world at all in some sense. And so I think increasingly we find ourselves worldless. Uh, 
we're without a world and it becomes a question of how to build a world. So we're in this infinite zone. It's a, what Marshall McLuhan would have called, I, I, I feel like I'm being overly technical and using a lot of uh, buzzwords and so on. So please probe me on any of these. But when Marshall McLuhan was describing um, the medium is the message, he meant in some sense, uh, the media of the time is the environment. And our environment today is not, um, is, 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 is uh, paradoxically not social, even though it's called social media. It's asocial. You were, I think before we were talking, before we started recording, uh, we were talking about being in an echo chamber. It's really a me chamber when we're on Twitter or whatever, we're stuck. And so it's about how to enter a world, uh, how to forge a link with the world, uh, how to invent an unconscious when there's not one already there, how to invent an other. And I think that increasingly today's revolutionaries are in this zone. It's like an oral, uh, sorry, in, uh, a spherical existence of auditory everywhereness. That's how I feel when I'm on Twitter. Everything's all at once, all around us. <laughs> okay. um, we have to carve out a space for ourselves, you know? And this has been another one of my debates with Zizek. Um, another one of my debates with Zizek is that uh, instead of the Christian world that he's promoting, Christian atheism, I think we need to be more like uh, the seven sleepers of the cave in Islam. In Islam, they're living in a limitless world of paganistic enjoyment, these seven sleepers of the cave. They decide to uh, go and find a cave. Um, so that they can dream again. They can actually have dreams, which means they have an unconscious, and they can have belief again, and they can believe in the one true God in their view. And I think that's a revolutionary act in a, in a, in a, in a time of pure excess and orgies, a time of yeah. sexual excess. Um, and so it was why I told him many years ago about this episode of Black Mirror called Nosedive which I think is a wonderful episode. He twisted it in his own way. I took it in my own way. Um, this woman is living in this world of what I call excess. And she's always having to enjoy herself and wear a smile and act pleasant so she can get good ratings for this and that interaction. And at the very end, she ends up in prison. And the prison is, is like a, a, a space of revolutionary potential. Because when she's in the prison, you sense uh, a fundamental subjective transformation in her. She can be the monster that she is. She can swear. She can be vulgar. And there's these beautiful tears that come down her face. And the, the music gets really nice and, and elevates. And then it ends. It's supposed to be a joyous moment when she's put in prison. Finding a cave, finding a prison, building a world. Uh, I think this is a fundamental point of disagreement between Zizek and I. He thinks we're already in a world. I think we're like the character in Looney Tunes who runs off the cliff, uh, floats in space, doesn't realize that he's already lost the ground beneath his feet, and so has to look down, and then he falls. The, the problem is extremely much worse than Zizek and his followers think. We never had a world from the very beginning. We have to learn how to build one. I think this is a, a key point. That's that's interesting. I'm not going to go into why I find it interesting because it would just be a bunch of like vague uh, references in my brain to other things I've read. Um, but uh, I did want to ask you to expand a little on the Marshall McLuhan part. I, I think most people are familiar with the the slogan, the medium is the message. Um. I'm not, but I'm curious how you're, what you're doing with that when you connect it with uh, the subconscious and this notion of world or worlding, you might say. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so let, let me give a bit of a primer on Marshall McLuhan's work, uh, and it can be helpful, and then I'll take it the next step. Uh, so the medium is the massage. That's how McLuhan wrote it. 
uh, massage uh, message or massage. McLuhan loved to play with language. Um, you'll find in one of his books, it's misspelled on the title, massage, which means mass age, age of masses, or massage. The media massages us, which means uh, we, we swim in the media like a fish swims in water. This is how McLuhan put it. Um, the fish um, exists in its environment without knowing much of its environment in the same way that we are affected and exist in our environments, but do not necessarily know its effects. So in, let's say, a literate age, an age of the book, um, uh, or a literate culture, literate in a McLuhanian sense, not in a commonsensical sense. For McLuhan, it means when, if the book is your media, because for McLuhan, everything is media, not just traditional media. The book, of course, is traditional media, but when you read it, you read it sequentially, unidirectionally, page by page, left to right. So in a literate culture, you can expect when you go to a shop, it will be a literate social interaction, by which I mean you stand in a lineup, they take you one at a time, one by one, and then you leave the cash. It's sequential, uh, unidirectional, and so on. But in an oral-based culture, such as the one that some people would claim I'm in right now, and that's not not uh, That's not uh, uh, it's not meant to be a, a, a bad thing. It's not a normative statement. Oral cultures are spherical. They're cultures of the ear. And what's interesting about the ear, unlike cultures of the eye, cultures of the eye you're reading, right? You can close your eyes. The ears are the only orifice you can't easily close. Uh, so it's hard to close your ears. Uh, so everything, sounds swirl all around you, all at once, not sequentially. Simul it's a principle of simultaneity. So you can expect in an oral-based culture that if you go to a shop, there will be crowds around the cash register. And the person at the cash register will take a little of your order, a little of your order, and kind of go around all at once. And this is precisely what happens. And you can talk about that at shops. You can talk about that in terms of crossing the street. Uh, don't get me started on trying to cross the street as a Canadian in, in India. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, but it, you get used to it. Uh, and uh, so, so, so the media structures our social relationships. I think of media in a McLuhanian sense as a type of gravity. It structures our social bonds in space and time. Um, so in an age of social media where the media is very light, there's not much gravity, we lose our bodies. We become disembodied. It began with the television for Marshall McLuhan. Because unlike the mirror where you can see your, your reflection coming back at you and you can say, oh, it's moving. I can feel my muscles moving too. There's, that's me in the mirror. With the television, uh, the video camera, you can take uh, a photo of the body and it doesn't come back at you at the same time. So there can be a time delay, which causes body trouble. Okay. Uh, so as you start to realize what's happening with the media today, um, I mean, just look at, for example, the debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as it played out on social media. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I went during the, the debates and I looked at their Twitter feeds and it was fascinating to see the difference. This is an age of social media, both of them on social media, on Twitter. Hillary Clinton's Twitter account was filled with grammatically correct punctuation. It was like reports she was writing to her professor for a grade, fact-based and so on. It was literate. Trump's was all over the place. He was using, he, he spelled kafafi kaf instead of coffee. You know, he yeah. had capital letters. He said one thing, then he said a different thing and another thing. He was using what Freud called kettle logic. Um, I didn't break the kettle. It was already broken. Um, the, uh, the kettle, uh, you broke the kettle. <laughs> you know, three mutually exclusive arguments. I didn't fire James Comey. Somebody else fired James Comey and so on, these sorts of things. He was suited, he's suited to the media of the time in this way. So 
now when I'm looking at the media, increasingly what I see is an evolution of media toward infinity. And it shows us a worldlessness. And if you'll just hear me out for another me minute, I'll give you a, a really good example, a really clear example. My favorite video game when I was a child, Super Mario Brothers. I love this game. I still love this game. Number one, Super Mario Brothers number one. How do you play Super Mario Brothers number one? Like a person reads a book. You go, it's mm -hmm. a side scroll. You go left to right, world one, one, then world one, two, chapter two, one, and so on. My son, 10 years ago, I think, picked up a game, Mario Maker. You know, Mario Maker is one of the first games, but it's not the first game that I've noticed. There's, there's many games before where the game comes to you disassembled. You build your own game. And Game Genie did this a long time ago, too, but you needed to be a certain type of person. It was an appendage. It was an auxiliary organ, this sort of stuff. But now you have things like Minecraft and so on. Children are thrown into a worldless universe without rules. There's no totality here. There's no unknown knowledge. And what they have to do is they have to invent a space, a world for themselves. And it's wonderful what these kids are learning. Uh, my son would go onto Minecraft with his friends. They'll build up these walls and they're inventing their own rules and their own game there to survive the devouring maternal infinity which is exactly what it is um it's a survival skill we need to know how to build worlds today and if you think it's just confined to social media and video games it's not for a long time one more minute and then i promise i'll shut up this is the real infinity um <laughs> uh, it's uh in sociology we've known this for quite some time, there was an American sociologist. I think we need to go much further than him. I think there's all kinds of problems with his work. His name's George Ripser. And he wrote this wonderful book titled McDonaldization of Society. Um, but he also invented a fascinating uh, concept, prosumer capitalism. Only in a psychotic age do you get these wonderful neologisms. <laughs> You know, that, that's what Deleuze said uh, our task is, to invent concepts. He invented this concept, prosumer, which is producer and consumer in one. And he said, this defines our time. We, we produce the very objects that we are consuming. You know, we used to just call that psychosis or autism or whatever. But this is what we do in our, in our economy today. You go to McDonald's, you build your own Big Mac. You go to Ikea, they send you the stuff. You build it yourself. You know, and we're even prosuming our educations today. We're prosuming our philosophy and so on. You know, so this is the this is the 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 the, the environment that we're in. Uh, it's not an environment that is uh, that operates according to a principle of repression uh, that that has some sort of ideology that we just need to tap into. We've we, we have it as a tacit knowledge or whatever. I think it, it's much worse than all of that. And this constitutes my, again, my fundamental disagreement uh, with, with Zizek on, on this point. Where, where do you think all the paranoia comes from in this kind of situation? With, um, you know, it's, I, I, it feels like the majority uh, or a very large minority of criticism uh, between different political factions is... Uh, a paranoia about where someone is getting their marching orders from, their their ideology from, whether or not it's uh, provided by some kind of toxic personality, this and that. Do you think there's some kind of relation there between the uh, this um, uh, quality of worldness or lack of worldness, or is this uh, to something distinct? I, I love that you said that because. Uh, you won't hear Zizek talk a lot about paranoia. And I think there's a good reason for it. Um, so I have a lot of things I need to try and form it in. Okay, so let's begin with, with uh, uh, the war uh, between military exercises between Ukraine and Russia. We know who it's really between, but let's say Ukraine and Russia. You remember when Biden looked into uh, Putin's eyes when he met Putin 
And he comes back to the West and he reports upon what he saw. He said, when I looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, I saw the soul of a killer. And I thought this moment was fascinating. And I said this before Putin's rebuttal. I'm not proud of it. Uh, maybe Putin's taking notes. But I said, you know, what's interesting is I think what Biden saw in Putin's eyes was his own soul reflected back at him. The soul of American imperialism for all these years, you know, and it was a few months later, Putin said that himself. After I said it, I said it first, <laughs> but Putin said it. And I thought it was a really intelligent response. I'm not a Putinista. I'm not on Putin's side here. But this is the problem with Putin. He tells the he 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 inflicts horrible violence through truth telling. And the West really is what Putin calls it, an empire of lies. But that's the beauty of the West. You know, lies are are, are not all evil. Lies are wonderful. But this was a moment of paranoia. And I think in an era of foreclosure where we need to start developing a more robust theory of what foreclosure is and its various registers and so on. Lacan had a wonderful expression in his third seminar. He said, what is foreclosed in the symbolic returns in the real. I think what we witnessed, that was his definition of madness. I think that's what we witnessed with Biden. He foreclosed his, uh, something and it returned to him. And that's the definition of paranoia as well. Paranoia is when you deny the humanity of others um, and, and uh, I mean Freud called it a, a double in his essay on the uncanny. There's, there's a, a, a horrible castrating device that's projected out into the field of the other. Uh, this can only exist in a world uh, that is worldless. If my thesis is correct, there wouldn't be paranoia at this scale. And it's not just Putin. Let's be honest. In Russia, there's uh, what is called uh, foreign agent laws. And a foreign agent law is heightened paranoia. Basically, the idea is if, you, if we perceive that you are a threat to the internal consistency of our social bond, we spit you out. You're not Russian. You're a foreign agent. You're tied to George Soros or whoever else, American interests, whatever. You're a foreign agent. You must publicly declare yourself as such. Just, I, I risk this only to provoke, but purely at the level of logic, this, isn't this also what we see in the newest social movements? in so-called cancel culture and woke uh, politics. Yes. If, you, if you introduce a split, a fissure, a castrating device into the group or whatever it is, an alternative opinion, whatever it is, you are spit out of the group. You have to publicly declare you're wrong in front of the mob. Uh, I think that, that we have so much of the Russian soul inside of us that we deny. And so paranoia exists in an era of madness. To, I mean, I, I, I'm so thankful that you brought up this idea of paranoia for that reason, because you're, you're hearing it more and more. People talk about paranoia, but you don't hear Zizek mention it. Yeah, it seems. Yeah, it seems very uh, visible just everywhere to me that you know, I mean, you brought up George Soros, you know, there's all the anti-Semitic old paranoias, but there's all sorts of paranoias that have uh, motivated political, uh, you know, McCarthyism, uh, anti, you know, uh, xenophobic sort of anti-communism in the before that. There's all sorts of like paranoid political styles, I guess. And there's even that book, right? The Paranoid Style in American whatever by, uh, oh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but it's, so, it's also a thing, like paranoia is not necessarily bad either. Paranoia in some sense can also mean that uh, somebody sees you as an individual. And it's not necessarily a bad thing paranoia 
you know, I, the, even Jacques Alain Miller somewhere, you'll have to find it in one of these um, journals, maybe a, the journal I help with, uh, I don't know, um, the Lacanian Review. Um, he says, he calls for a guided paranoia. It's a very delicate thing and very precise, so I don't want to tarnish it uh, if somebody wants to go looking for it. But I, I, I don't think we should, uh, we should have this gut reaction to the idea of paranoia and even to the idea of madness. You know, paranoia could be ego building. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, there's, I mean, you know, some evolutionary psychologist or something would say there's the, you know, it's an extension of the running from the lion in the bush that you don't, that isn't there or whatever. Like if it is there, you know, it's good that you ran. If it isn't there, not really a big deal that you ran. Right. That's like the evolutionary explanation. But um, so, OK, so where does negation come into all this or the negative or negativity? This uh, what your recent book is about. This is a source of confusion because. Where shall I begin? Um, I have problems with words. Somebody could cut just that sound clip. I have problems with words uh, because um, it, it, the words, the con the conceptual status of a word is quite meaningless uh, to me. It has, it doesn't have the value. It, it it's you know, when when we operate at the level of concepts and we say negativity always equals whatever, we're presuming that everybody uses the word in the same way, and sure. um, so I'm open to using it in different ways. But on the other hand, I've noticed that the way that the word is often used um, seems contrary to the way that Freud intended. Um, well, let me make this a little more concrete for you. So there is, uh, you know, an essay that came out, I don't know, probably 10 years ago at this point that made its rounds in the anarchist circles that I interact with about um, about negation and the, the function of negation in anarchist theory. Uh, Alejandro, I'm trying to remember the guy's name that wrote it. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And I believe this is sort of a Hegelian or at least dialectical use of the term. And you could find this in Bakunin. You could, you know, there's a lot of use of negation within anarchist discourse in a specifically dialectical way um so in relation to that context is that what you're referring to or are you talking about a different kind of negativity well let me try and work an answer i think um i think that there's a negativity that is the security of madness by which I mean a type of negativity that poses as such, but that is actually uh, something more similar to censorship. Um, how can I explain this? Um, for Lacan, the only negativity that seems to matter, as far as I can tell, I'm willing to be corrected, I'm just thinking on the spot, is the negativity that um, desaturates enjoyment. And that negativity for a very long time in Lacan's teaching came from the law, the no of the father, which is a function, not a person or a state, it's a function. The non de pair desaturates jouissance. So the non de pair says no, and there's a negativity in the drive, in jouissance. Some of it is taken away. Um, but what happens in the dream world um, is what I call a phone negativity, a phone egg. A phone egg is the security of ensuring that you never wake up that you keep dreaming. It's a type of negativity that's permitted in the dream. 
you know, when we're dreaming, um, there's a certain um, displacement of meaning um, and a condensation of meaning, uh, which Lacan had identified as metaphor and metonymy. And these were um, ways of ensuring that we never wake up because that's the last thing we want to do is wake up. In other words, we don't want to get rid of our enjoyment, our satisfaction. We don't mm -hmm. want it negated. And we will invent all kinds of strategies, including theories of the death drive, including Lacanian theories, including theories of negativity to keep us from waking up. And so I think that's what's been going on in a lot of philosophy and politics, uh, political philosophy, political theory, uh, particularly political theories of the death drive. Um, and, and I think some of the theories that I know of that are staunchly about negativity seem to me to be rather about stubborn insistence on one's enjoyment. Uh, um, so for me, it's a question of what constitutes a true negativity. And for me, a true negativity is one that would relieve us of some of our enjoyment. And I know that's really abstract, but it's, um, it's the answer that I find to be most true. Okay, so this is very, so in trying to develop foreclosure, this would not, not be the same thing as that, or you're not, uh, I mean, they're maybe related, but you're trying to pull something distinct out of foreclosure, right? Foreclosure is often talked of as one of, one of a few modalities of negation, but in fact, it's nothing of the sort. Foreclosure means that you have not accepted the negation of the father. That's what it means. It means you are, in some sense, um, uh, saturated in jouissance, in, in mm. enjoyment, forgive me. So, uh, but foreclosure can mean other things too in Lacan, so we have to be very careful. That's true of any concept in Lacan. It depends... Um, you know, because there's foreclosure of the subject, there's foreclosure of the nom de pair, there's for, there's there's many types of foreclosure in Lacan's teaching. Uh, but the, the the one that most people know of, particularly those who follow Zizek, I'm trying to keep it on Zizek. Zizek is a friend, by the way. <laughs> so it yes. sounds like I'm really That's, like yeah. lashing out. He encourages me to critique him. Um, this is why I admire him. Uh, but... Um, but I have found within the, 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 the milieu of those who follow uh, Zizek uh, a certain one-dimensional conceptual version of um, foreclosure in Lacan. Foreclosure always equals foreclosure of the nom de pair. But it's not, it's not the case. Uh, the university discourse, I credit Joel Goldbatch for reminding me of this two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, the university discourse clearly forecloses the subject uh, in Lacan. So, and, and I apologize for those who are not Lacanians, you, you can go find out what the university discourse is for Lacan. Um, but, um, so, so yeah, you could say, if you're talking about foreclosure in terms of psychosis, there is no relinquishment of Jewish Okay. Uh, interesting. So, I know we talked a lot about, um, boundaries and such last time and this sort of, or, or the issues of, uh, this sort of infinite, um, uh, type of pleasure that you're proposing. I don't want to recover that ground. Um, but I am curious if you've developed on that anymore since the last time we talked on this, uh, the role of boundaries and where they, uh, how they become politically important. Um, yeah. Um, 
I, I haven't, I mean, I'm sure I have developed it, but I, I never developed things in a coherent sort of way. Uh, but I, 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 I do believe that one of uh, the major political acts of our time uh, will be from uh, those who feel themselves to be worldless. Um, and it will be in their ability to know how to make worlds. Uh, I think that this is fundamental. It's something I've been trying to implement in my own pedagogy as a teacher. Uh, I'm not necessarily, first and foremost, trying to transmit knowledge. I'm also not, first and foremost, trying to get them to treat the world as a text that needs to be deciphered. Uh, what I'm trying to do is begin where they are, which is uh, a space without boundaries. And to place them quite literally in a room where there's movable furniture, for example, and they can pull this furniture around and build spaces for themselves so that they can write on the walls and have a knowledge surrounding them. And, uh, and I've, I found some success in that. Um, it's the same with a lot of patients that have come to see me. Um, a significant number of them are in their rooms. Um, their idea of world is always something of an extension of themselves through gadgets. They reach out to the world from their bedrooms, through their cell phones, through their computers, uh, and so on. And they struggle to enter the labor market. They struggle to enter, uh, to find value for their uh, artistic productions of various kinds. Uh, how to monetize it, how to make a living for oneself, how to feel valued in the world. These are the problems of the time for people. It's not, the problems of the time are not out in the streets. The problems of the time are in the bedroom. Um, we're really witnessing today philosophy in the bedroom. Like, but it's not what Desaad was saying, and it's not exactly what uh, Kant, or sorry, uh, Lacan was saying about Kant of saw it either what 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 we're witnessing are philosophers unable to get outside of the rooms they do philosophy literally in the bedroom um so they they're philosophers without worlds it's quite different from the philosophers of yesterday who were clearly in the world so i think um i think uh the challenge is uh, to help people develop strategies for world building in their own lives through their own inventions. All right. So here's something that I find challenging about this kind of idea. And it's like, how do we not become Walt Disney or how do we, uh, how does the social aspect enter into world building? Like, or maybe not social is the right word, but a weeness uh, that building the world is a, a project you do with other people, not necessarily something you, you know, you're not just like the dark prince in his castle or whatever. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it's interesting because the way I see it is, um, and I do think weeness is a wonderful word for it. I think that uh, because it's uh, it, it gets rid of the P part, in the penis. <laughs> I, th I think that what we call weenus today is often nothing of the sort. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's no different from being isolated in the bedroom and being isolated in a, in a, in a social movement with others. Uh, that's not necessarily a world. It's it can be just as boundarylessness, just as boundaryless. <laughs> sorry, it can be just as boundaryless. Um, and in fact, I I mean I've had patients who were very much involved in social movements, and they thought they were building a world for themselves outside. Whenever they would go out with uh, uh, several of their let's call it activist friends but they never felt like they had an identity for themselves. They always felt like somebody's boundaries were being blurred. Um, and uh, so, so I'm not convinced that leaving the room necessarily gets you outside of the problem. Uh, 
the uh, a social movement is not a world. Uh, I think what I would call a world uh, is something much more different that uh, that is not fraternal. Uh, that is not based upon some sort of isolation from the world together. I use that expression quite consciously because that's the expression Lacan used when he described fraternities, comrades, uh, and so on. He said they isolate together. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and and I think I mean that's that's what I see a lot of in today's newest social movements. I see a segregation between groups, whereas before the idea, of course, was that we felt not segregated between groups, but kind of uh, alienated within an overarching world or group. That's the difference from the Marxist pre-1844 worldview, where we were alienated within a world that we could call capitalism, alienated from other people, but in the same factory. Or whatever. Uh, and today's movements uh, that are not alienated uh, within a world, but alienated from the world, and the word that Lacan used for that was segregation. Uh, echo chamber, if you like, that was Marshall McLuhan's word long before the internet. Marshall McLuhan said the echo chamber was coming, his exact phrase. Um, and I mean, if you look at his prophecy in a way, of the global village of interconnectivity, what we have today, he said, uh, the more we go out, the more we go in. And uh, and we end up more and more isolated. Uh, and I think uh, his prophecy is true. It came true. Yeah, that's a tough, that's definitely a tough problem to try to work on. Um, you know, I, what I'm more familiar with is like, this conversation happening in the with the terminology from Heidegger, the German like mit sein um, debate between the different uh, phenomenologists, but it seems to be pretty important in psychoanalysis as well. Obviously, yeah, there was a brief moment in Lacan's early teaching where he seriously encountered Heidegger. Um, you can find it in his Ecree. Um, 1950s or something like that. Uh, the idea of being toward death he took from Heidegger. Uh, and he got something from Heidegger's understanding of language and, and so on. But uh, it's very clear that Lacan became post-Heideggerian and post-Hegelian. Uh, this, I think, doesn't make a lot of my friends and people I work with um, uh, Happy. They disagree with me on this point. They think, of course, that Lacan was quite the Hegelian um, and that uh, Lacan and Hegel are very compatible with one another and Lacan and Heidegger are very compatible with one another. But on the question of world, I think it's clear that on this point, Lacan goes beyond Heidegger. And on the question of drive, I think it's clear that Lacan goes beyond Hegel. And it's on these two points where Lacan goes beyond or before, or somewhere else, <laughs> that I think uh, I think some people miss. Um, what is what is drive in Hegel? I'm not at all familiar with that. Yeah, um, well, you know, it's a it's a ongoing debate uh, between myself and some others that I won't mention. But you know, the idea of dialectic, which mm -hmm. I, simplifying to the extreme. Uh, doesn't function without a world. At the right, level of right. drive, well, at, the, at the purest level of drive, let's say the dark part of the unconscious, the unconscious as such, we're not dealing with uh, dialectic. In fact, when we talk to an alcoholic, we're not interested in dialectics, we're interested in the fixations. Fixation is not dialectic. There's something in every speaking being that resolutely refuses to be incorporated into any dialectic. Sterner knew this. Max Sterner knew this. What Sterner outlined in the movement from, let's say, theology to Feuerbach 
was a repetition, not a dialectic. It's the same. In fact, it could be worse. <laughs> you know, this sort of idea. Repetition for Lacan is not reducible to dialectic. These are two different logics. And the repetition, the repetitious circuit of the drive, of the one more, of the one again, and so on, um, uh, and even of the of what's singular for Lacan, uh, there's nothing of dialectics here. And I think this is something that Stirner exposed, showed, but it's also something that Lacan developed quite well. Um, I'm, in some sense, stealing an idea and making it a bit more simple and naive that I heard in Dublin many uh, four or five years ago from Rick Luce, a psychoanalyst in Dublin. He, he said, dialectics and repetition. And I just, I always love this. I think it, it shows clearly what's at stake. Uh, so, so, yeah, repetition at the level of drive. Yeah, my mind's going all over the place now with that. Like, <laughs> So I'm going to see if I could focus on something. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I don't want to. Their fixity is an interesting thing in that way, right? The pre the perseverance of uh, an identity or a fixity through time would sort of point towards some kind of repetition. And that would... That's an interesting thing to examine. I haven't thought of it that way before. So... And then, you know, obviously... For Lacan, he talks about the dialectics of desire. Dialectics of desire. And you can think dialectic in a dream world, in a world. Uh, but the when, when you're talking to somebody who's suffering from addictions, for example, or somebody who has a certain type of pathology, like, for example, maybe for 20 years of their life, they keep falling in love with the person who cheats on them, or they keep having a nightmare about a woman running away from them, or they keep something like this. Uh, that's a repetition. Uh, and and it, it, it's a completely different logic because you have, to, you have to isolate the one of the repetition from the reoccurrence. Um, whereas in dialectics, what you're doing is not necessarily a repetition. Uh, there's, 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 a, there's a different uh, logic going on there. And I, I think this is something that should really be developed uh, by some wonderful thinker somewhere. That won't be me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, or you might get stuck with it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's tie this into anarchism a little bit. Because from some things I've seen you post or whatever, I, the anarchy somehow is coming into this correspondence with Zizek, isn't it? Or is, am I, did I misread something or? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I was in Sas Fe 2011, I told him I was doing a project on Stirner. I called him a nihilist. Jiji kept calling him an anarchist. He says, yes, he's the one young Hegelian we need to do more work on. Um, and when I defended Malair, not Malair, but some of Malair's teachings, which isn't a defense of Malair, um, suddenly Zizek called me an anarchist and called those Malarians anarchists. Um, it's interesting. Before he called Malair a Stalinist, then an anarchist, and... Uh, <laughs> So it's, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, Zizek has it in his head that this debate has something to do with Marxism versus anarchism. I'm not convinced necessarily that it does. Maybe it does. Uh, but he keeps he keeps bringing this up for some reason. That's very funny. Yeah, I, I, I mean, one of my pet peeves is definitely the way that Marxists will uh, label something anarchist when it... Uh, uh, this is somewhat off topic but i mean uh i'm seeing you know this accusation that the the autonomous zone in seattle during the black lives matter 
um, heyday, you might call it, during the pandemic, that this was a, bit, a fundamentally anarchist event or occupation. And I see the same accusation happen about the Occupy movement in general. And it's, you know, it comes from some variety of Marxists that if something is not, you know, organized by a political party, suddenly it becomes an anarchist organization. And then, I mean, it, that's one variety of the way the the label gets uh, assigned. When yeah. we, I mean, from experience, I could confidently say that most people are not ideologically uh, um, consistent who show up to these things. There's not really a a faction of uh, or a majority of anarchists or a majority of Marxists. It's usually, little group hustles that uh try to convince everybody to join their team. But <laughs> mm. Mm. I mean, I'm not opposed to the, to, to it. I just, uh, I think the stakes are bigger, uh, you know, than a simple packaging of a set of ideas under the word anarchism. It doesn't sound very anarchist to me. In fact, I'm, I'm very much interested in the fact that in the idea that perhaps Lacan's later teaching, guided by Malheur's, is a type of anarchism, and perhaps one that's more anarchistic than a lot of the anarchism that I uh, come to learn about and practice for decades of my life. Um, you know, and so in a certain way, I do think there's some truth to that, but I, I, I don't want that to be the way in which the debate gets framed because I think it's it's over much more fundamental principles and ideas than simply oh choose your cho choose your identification or choose your tool or you know it's like a supermarket of politics or something like do you want Marxism or anarchism let's 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 speak at a, at a little bit more of a of a higher level than that and try and actually get to get to what's at stake you know, if anything, let's be honest, the Marxists have become quite the anarchists over the years. <laughs> They've increasingly become more and more anarchistic, um, yes. more focused on practices, more and more organizing according to practices, more and more suspicious of the state and so on and so on and so on. So in, in some sense, you know, I've even heard some people say, you've probably heard this too, 10 years ago, everybody's anarchist now. It becomes a question of like, okay, but what are we talking about now? Let's actually have the discussion instead of <laughs> yeah. like just throwing throwing these empty words out there and, and allowing people to identify and project all of their ideas onto these and just assume they know what the other person is thinking. I think that's, that's just uh, not a good way to have a, a discussion. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a way to avoid a discussion a lot of the time, I think. Yeah. Maybe not intentionally, but uh, I, there, yeah. So I don't know. So where, what's the status of what you're working on now? You got the sociology book about to come out. I don't want you to spoil anything. You don't want to spoil about it, but. Um, I don't, I don't uh, know what's in that book. I think I wrote it last year. Very. Yeah, I don't. I don't really remember. Oh, oh, this book is. Uh, it was written during the war when I was in Russia. Okay. So, so it was really a theory. Actually, you'll see if you look at this book where I predicted the war. Um, I mean, the book's coming out after the war, so you'll just have to take my word for it. This was written before the war, uh, and I was warning my students. I said, "Make no mistake. Uh, we know what's about to happen. We know what's coming." And, I, and, and so I was working this. So this book was written before the war. And yet uh, so much of the book is about the war. And as you get to some of the later chapters, you'll see, I think I'm writing while I'm a refugee. I'm writing while I'm in Kazakhstan. I'm writing while I'm, while I'm wandering the streets of Vienna and, and uh, Budapest and Ireland and, and so on. And so there's a lot of kind of... Uh, thinking about what psychoanalysis and and and, and society uh, what can be thought about that at a time of war which is really significant because um, so much of psychoanalysis uh, was reinvented during wartime and so much of anarchism was reinvented 
during wartime. And so, oh, yeah. um, so, mu so much of the social bonds that we now associated as kind of staples of anarchist organizing were developed in the context of civil wars and uprisings and so on. And so there's something about war that, that inspires invention invention of a of a of a, a re new relationship to the other to the social bond as such and so that this you know there was even a moment when i ended up again remember i'm 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 homeless as many of us are whether we know it or not today um uh, and, and i'm in vienna and i end up uh at the freud museum and i'm looking at this exhibit at the freud museum about what these psychoanalysts had to do when the war came to them and how they had to go all around the world and try and find a way to make a living, how to reinvent themselves, how to rethink who they were, how they related to all of this, how it challenged their ideas. Freud ends up in London and, you know, all these things, some are going to America. Can they practice there? Do they have to get retraining? And so, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about what this does to people, this uh, apparent death drive. And I'm realizing, this is the real tale of the book. I realized that the time of war is not negative. Uh, wartime is not a negative time any more than depression is a negative affect. This is really mm. controversial. And I can imagine, yeah. you know, if people, if people don't interpret what I'm saying properly, they would be led to the wrong conclusion about what I'm saying. Depression, war... These are resolutely positive moments of history. There are times where there's no way to tranquilize the passions. There's no way to form symbolic pacts. Um, this idea of building new trade agreements and building new relationships between nations and, and forming peace treaties and all this stuff is just, it's not possible. Uh, or it doesn't feel possible. You have to be clever. You have to be inventive, and so um, so this is what's happening when I when I wrote that book. What I'm working on now is a lot of bureaucratic stuff in Pakistan. Um, I'm I'm I think I'm going to Belfast for that conference. I don't know if you'll be there, the Anarchist Studies Network conference. Uh, no, that would. That would be amazing, but I didn't uh, plan for it. So maybe next uh, year if they have one. I think it's at the Is end it of August. Annual? So you have time if you want to go. Uh, maybe it's the beginning of September. So there's still there's still time. Uh, yeah, and you know I'm working on a few other little things. Um, um, some of them more uh, practical, having to do with um, psychoanalysis in Pakistan. And I'm doing some research on a person in Pakistan who uh, he left right he right before the partition. He went to uh, the United Kingdom, became a I was going to say a footstool of Donald Winnicott. Uh, maybe he was um, named Masad Khan, who is this very controversial uh, a psychoanalyst. And I think there's there's something there that can that can teach maybe us those of us who are interested in psychoanalysis. Uh, but it, maybe even anarchists um, about uh, different forms of madness and uh, the madness of British uh, psychoanalysis at the time in the treatment of, uh, of Masad Khan and, and others from outside of the United Kingdom. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I've got a few little projects here and there. In very interesting. Why don't we wrap up on sort of a random question, somewhat personal to me, not anything I wouldn't want to talk about. Do you journal? Do you keep a diary? Um, I used to. I haven't been yeah, using it. Yeah, I used it, to as well. But I think, I mean, I kind of still do. I have one that's completely private. Nobody would ever find it, but I haven't written in it in quite a while. You know, I'll write stupid poetry and stuff like that. But I think it's an important practice because um, there's this Marxist uh, sociologist, very well known. I would love to critique him. I won't waste your time with it. But his name is C. Wright Mills. And C. Wright Mills, in one of his books, uh, he had a chapter, I think it was called Invitation to Sociology, where he said, you know, 
if you want to be a good sociologist, this is before live journal and social media and all these tools we had, keep kind of index cards every time you get an idea and just write it down and just file it. And I think um, journaling, writing a diary and so on is a bit like that. And I think we should do it. In fact, um, a lot of articles that I write come from just taking these ideas as modules and plugging them in to a greater sort of whole. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, incredibly important um, as a even as a political tool. It's a, maybe even a part of world building for some people. Uh, yes, it absolutely was for me. And then I stopped doing it and haven't quite figured out why I did. That's something I'll figure out on my own. But uh, yeah, it definitely has been a noticeable um, practice that that changed the way that I did my daily life. Right. So I thought it would be an interesting question to ask you as well. And, you know, with the sort of like self-censorship -cens now that we have uh, using social media, we don't have this sort of like live journal uh, attitude, I think, uh, as, a, as a a lot of people don't, at least. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm wondering if that's a dying art or if people are maintaining their journaling practice offline or what's going on. But well, I think I think a lot of journaling is coming out as books now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we could even say Zizek's books are like just his journaling. <laughs> just journaling constantly, just endlessly kind of writing, you know? Uh, so in of itself, I don't think it's a panacea because I think that there's, there are, there are some who I think get a lot of pleasure out of writing and there's, they'll just keep writing and writing and writing. And we're wondering if I'm wondering if um, it's actually having, the, having a, a good effect. Like we're at a time now where I think a lot of writing is nothing of the sort I, I was even saying that um, bookshelves look like Instagram feeds to me because every book, uh, it doesn't feel like it's written. It feels like it's uh, a photograph of its author. I mean, I mean this as a metaphor, but it just feels like um, everybody's writing. Um, not much of it is uh, impactful. Um, everybody's got um, uh, ideas and they're all just kind of, uh, just endlessly kind of flowing out of some people. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that in of itself is a good thing. I think there's a, a, there's a knowing how to write as well. And uh, I'm not sure I've, you know, one thing I do though, I'm going on, on my own tangent. I do write about my dreams. In fact, I wrote about okay. my dreams. I wrote about my dreams last night. Can I tell you, can we end with this thought? Is that okay with you? Yeah, that sounds okay. perfect. Okay, I want to end with this thought. I had a dream last night. It was the first time I had a dream in a very long time. I think I told you about it before we started recording. I told you I had a dream. It was about Shishik. And you know what the dream was? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm trying to remember it. It was a dark, sort of apocalyptic, shadowy, uh, vacuous uh, cityscape. There were no bodies there. There was a dialogue between Zizek and I in the dream. Maybe one of the first times I had a dream about Zizek, maybe because we were having this today. Um, and Zizek was somewhere far, and, and we were having this discussion, and it was about the war, Ukraine um, and, and Russia. And... Um, I don't remember the content of the debate, but I remember I said something and it forced him to be silent for a moment. And I could hear in his silence in the dream, um, he understood that I had an entrenched point of view. He had an entrenched point of view. He realized I had a point. I realized he had a point. Um, we were fundamentally at odds with one another about fundamental issues. And yet he still wanted to be friendly about it. And so after the pause, he tried, but it was like this false pleasantness. And this was the dream. <laughs> Jeez. Well, all it's right. Funny. I think that's a good point uh, to stop recording. I obviously love having me on the show. It's good to talk to you. 
and uh, I'm sure the audience is going to appreciate it as well. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to hit the end button here. Thank you so much.